when was the last time you prayed? I mean, before this, like before the songs that we just sang and the, the prayers that we prayed, before that, when was the last time you prayed? Now, I think prayer is one of those things that uh, we all, most of us probably feel like uh, is really, really important. It's probably something we want to do more often. It's, it, it's probably something that we would say we, we could probably be better at, but we probably don't feel very confident in it and maybe even not sure how to do it. And because of that, I think most of us probably, if we're honest, most often only pray in two extremes. When things are really, really bad or when things are really, really good. The one extreme is to treat prayer like that fire extinguisher. That I mean, we only get that if there's an emergency and we're in dire, you know, desperate situations. Like when the red and blue lights show up in the rear view mirror after we've been speeding. Dear God, please. Or if you're a student, maybe when you have the exam and you know you didn't study as much as you should, and so you, you desperate times call for desperate measures, and so you throw one up like, oh God, if you'll help me pass this, I will. And you make some deal uh, with God. Or truthfully, maybe it's when things in life are really a lot more serious and dire. Like you just got the report from the doctor that you or somebody you love is terminally ill. Or maybe it's the reality that your finances are a wreck and the bills are due and you have no idea how you're going to pay them. Or maybe it's a relationship that, that you can just feel it's hanging on by a thread and it is not going to make it. You see, in those very real moments of desperation, I think all of us feel this, this natural inclination to pray to call on God, someone bigger than us outside of ourselves to help us with a situation that we just don't know what to do. The other extreme, I think we often feel this natural inclination to pray, is when things go really, really good. When the doctor gives us the news, the disease is gone. Thank you, Jesus, right? Or um, when we get the acceptance letter or scholarship notice that, that, that we are in or we qualify or they gave it to us, right? It's like, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Or when some unexpected financial blessing comes your way. For example, I was on a walk not long ago and I saw something out of the corner of my eye. And so I, I looked at it and it was kind of folded up and I went over to it and it was a $20 bill just sitting out there on the edge of the sidewalk. And so I obviously picked it up, and in that moment I prayed, dear God, would you show me who lost this $20 that I might return it and tell them about the good news of Jesus? No, that's not what I prayed at all. I picked it up and I was like, thank you, Jesus, for your blessing. And I put it in my pocket and I kind of went on my way. When things go good for us, I think there's this natural inclination to pray. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying when things go really, really good or when things are really, really bad. We should pray in those times. But those should not be the only times that we pray. Prayer is meant to be this moment by moment, day by day, opportunity to connect with the creator of the universe, with God, and to gain his strength and his wisdom and to understand his priorities. And that's what prayer is meant to be. It's so much more than just praying in those extreme moments. And this is one of the practices we're trying to focus on and grow in during this Lent season. We want to grow in prayer. And so today, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about prayer. And we're going to talk about kind of three things when it comes to prayer. Here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to first talk about why prayer is sometimes difficult, because I think that's true for most of us. And then we're going to talk about the reasons we really should pray. And then we're going to end by just getting really practical and going, how can I pray better? How can we pray better this coming week? So, Let's begin with the reasons we neglect prayer. If you're taking notes today, which I want to invite you to do, you can do that on the app or, or maybe just on your own notepad right there, however you want to do that. Um, 
But let's go ahead and dig into these reasons we neglect prayer. And I'm just going to jump into these real quick. Uh, here they are. Here's the first one. I've talked to a lot of people that they would say, you know what? Sometimes the reason I don't pray is because I don't really know how to pray. I don't really know how to pray. Maybe for you, prayer was something that was only memorized as a child and you only participated in prayer like when you went to bed or maybe before a meal, right? And so you're like... Um, uh, you know, uh, prayer knowledge is pretty much uh, focused on God is great, God is good, thank you God for this food. Or rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, yay God, however maybe you learned it. And so because of that, maybe for you, you just don't know how to pray because nobody ever taught you to pray. Nobody ever discipled you in prayer. You were never around anybody that taught you how to make prayer uh, natural and comfortable. I think others of us would say maybe the reason we neglect prayer, uh, I've heard people say this over time, is, you know what, I just don't have time to pray. I mean, honestly, from the, the moment my smartphone wakes me up in the morning until the end of the day when I lay my head on that pillow, it's just one thing to the next. It's, you know, and especially now that maybe you are the teacher and for the kids that are at home still online, doing school and you just feel like you just have no margin and there's just no way that you have time to kind of fit it in your busy schedule. I think we've all been there. Or maybe you're here today and when it comes to prayer, you'd be honest and say this, you know what, I've tried it, but I just don't enjoy praying. Like maybe the times that you've prayed, you felt like it was this laborious task that, that you were constantly one moment to the next distracted. And so it just didn't feel like you accomplished anything. Or maybe you felt extremely bored or sleepy in prayer. And so you would go, you know, I've, I've done it. Uh, I've tried it, but um, there wasn't any passion to it. There wasn't any transformation in it for me. And so it's just not something I really want to do anymore. Finally, I think some of us would be really honest, and I think we would say this about prayer. Maybe the reason we don't pray is because we would say, you know what, I don't think prayer really works. I don't think prayer really works. And you might say that because in your past, there are things that you really, really prayed about. There were things that you really needed God to come through on. And maybe it was for you. Maybe you needed a physical healing or maybe somebody you loved was, in, was sick or maybe there was a relationship that was broken and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and absolutely nothing changed. And so because of that, you would say, I, I don't even know that prayer makes a difference. So why would I pray? I want you to know that I understand all of those thoughts and those feelings. And at multiple different times in my journey with Jesus, I've had to work through those same thoughts and feelings about prayer myself. But what I've discovered is that the reasons to pray are much more compelling and transformative than the reasons not to pray. And so I want to give you real quick some reasons that we do pray, some reasons that I pray. And so here's the first one. Reasons to pray, the first one is because prayer is personal. Prayer is personal. The first and primary goal of prayer is to change me, to heal me, to bring me closer to God, to gain a spiritual perspective over my natural reality. You see, in prayer, I am not trying to bring God down to me. In prayer, I'm trying to bring me up to God. I'm trying to gain his perspective over what is going on in my life. Prayer, more than anything, changes me. Jesus knew the power of personal prayer. It's something that as you look at Jesus' life and, and the rhythms that he lived in, here he is, fully God and fully man, yet Jesus needed and did pray regularly. Now, I, I, he, he needed the inner strength and perspective 
that came to him through prayer. I want to show you this, just one reference that that mentions this. It's in Luke chapter 5. In fact, this is just a short little verse. How about we all read it? out loud together, wherever you're watching from, whoever you're watching with, Luke 5, 16, out loud, ready, begin. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. When did Jesus do this? Once a month? Once a year? No, what does it say? Jesus often, right? This was a regular practice in Jesus' life. Just think about this. Jesus only had three years of public ministry. When you look at Jesus' life, there was only three years he was like out there on the center stage um, in Jerusalem, in, in Israel, that kind of part of the world. And so only three years to change the world, to accomplish God's mission for his life. And yet when you look at Jesus' life, what you'll discover is he was never in a hurry. Jesus was never in a hurry. He often, regularly took time to get away and be alone with God. Why? Because Jesus knew he needed to recharge. He needed to refuel, to connect with God in ways that would give him supernatural strength to do the things that God had planned for him to do. And so if Jesus, fully God, had to do this often, regularly, how much more important is it for you and I to make sure we are praying often and regularly? You see, prayer like fasting, which we talked about last week, it's these opportunities to refuel and refocus and realign ourselves with God. Why? So we can be strengthened for the things he has for us ahead. So that as we said last week, we can run our race. We can accomplish the things that God has for us. And so prayer is personal. More than anything, what prayer is about, it is about changing me. And another reason we pray is this. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is personal and prayer is powerful. Yes, prayer changes me. But something we see over and over again throughout the pages, the story in Scripture, is that when God's people prayed, circumstances often, not always, but often changed as well. We see the power of prayer in both stories and statements in Scripture. There's amazing stories where circumstances were one way, And then a person of God or the people of God prayed and those circumstances changed. You see it over and over again from the Old Testament um, Jewish history stories to the New Testament and the, and the, the stories of the early church. But you also see it in great statements. Uh, in scripture. I want to show you one of those statements in 1 John chapter 5. Look what it says. 1 John chapter 5 says, we live in the bold confidence that God hears our voices when we ask for things that fit his plan. And if we have no doubt that he hears our voices, in other words, God hears us when we pray, we can be assured that he moves in response to our call. Isn't that amazing? What that verse is revealing is that prayer moves the heart of God. And when our prayers are aligned with God's will and his priorities, it moves circumstances. Now, I know the pushback here because I felt it myself. And the pushback here is, wait a second, if something is already God's will, why does he need me to pray about it? I mean, why wouldn't God, if something is what he desires and he wants, why is God waiting for me to pray? Why doesn't he just do it? And the answer to that question is this. Because God invites us into his work. And God's primary goal through the circumstances, both good and bad, that come in our life is the transformation of us. That we would become more like Jesus. And so God invites us into his work and into his processes of how he is at work, both in our lives and in our world. And so God wants us to care about the things that he cares about. And he wants us to care about the things that he cares about so much that we would actually pray passionately about them. 
That's why we pray. When it comes to the power of prayer, here's the reality I just want to admit today, is that I don't know why some prayers are answered and some prayers aren't. I can just tell you, I don't know. I mean, one of the principles we've taught here for years is that we, every prayer has one of three answers. It's a no, it's a yes, it's a not yet. And sometimes on this side of heaven and eternity, we don't get the answer we want. I don't know why some people are healed and others are not. I don't know why some people are taken from us far too soon. I will be honest with you today, I do not understand all of God's ways. But I trust all of God's words. I don't understand all of his ways. But I've come to a place in my life where I trust all of his words. I trust God when he says that he is working all things together for good. Not that everything is good. Not that he caused the bad in our life but that even out of the worst a broken world can give us, God's word says that he promises to bring good out of it, from it. Beauty from ashes, scripture says, as the metaphor. I've learned to trust God's word that, you know what? We are more than just this physical body, that we really are a living soul. And to be absent from this body for those who are in Christ is to instantly be present with God the Lord. And so I don't understand the ways and, 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 and grappling with the loss of loved ones, but I trust God's word that those who are in Christ are with Christ. I trust his word that says we will meet again, we will be together again. I trust his word that God is working all things for ultimate restoration and redemption. And I trust that he's doing that on his time, not mine. And that until Jesus comes again to do that full restoration work, or until I go see him, I am going to trust in his ways and I'm going to trust in his power. Friends, prayer is powerful. It changes us when aligned with God's will and God's word and God's plan, it changes circumstances. And then here's the third thing. So prayer is personal, prayer is powerful. And another reason to pray is this, prayer is pleasing. Prayer is pleasing, specifically to God. Have you ever wondered if like your prayers bother God? I've had those thoughts before. Like, is God getting tired of hearing from me? I mean, are we interrupting him? Because surely he has something better to do than listen to me. I want to show you an amazing picture that is in Scripture. It's given to us in the book of Revelation of where our prayers go and even how our prayers are pleasing interruptions, if you will, to the regular scheduled program of heaven. This is this amazing picture. John, who writes Revelation, is given this, this vision, and that's what the entire book of Revelation is. He's given this vision into many things that will come and many things about what heaven is like. And look at what it says about our prayers in Revelation chapter 8. This is an incredible picture. Look at this. He's writing, and in, right in the middle, he says here in chapter 8, then another angel with, gold in, with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. And a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Isn't that just an incredible picture? That, that our prayers are part of the worship programming of heaven that, that they are, Scripture actually in other places uses the term like a pleasing aroma. That's the picture of the incense. 
that, that our prayers mix with these incense in heaven. They, they go before God and it pleases him. What an incredible picture. You see, it's amazing enough that our prayers are even heard in heaven, but to think that God pauses and moves in response to them and they please him? Wow. What an incredible picture. Now, as incredible of a picture as that is, my guess is most of us could still use a lot of practical help when it comes to how to pray. Like, it's probably something that we all would say, you know what, I I could use to get better at that. Uh, Jesus taught his friends how to pray, giving them what now is the most famous and easily the most recited prayer in history. It's known as the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. And I want to use Jesus' words and Jesus' model to help us grow in how we pray today. Because this is the primary way that I pray. Not just reciting, but I pray through the Lord's Prayer as a pattern, as a a launching pad to deepen um, my prayer time. And and so I want to use the Lord's Prayer. We, in fact, just taught on this uh, over the course of, I think, three or four weeks during our With series. So if you want to dig a little deeper, I'm going to give you this in just a few minutes. But we did like three or four weeks on this back last, I believe it was November. So if you go back to our website, you look at the With series, the last three or four weeks of that series were all on the Lord's Prayer and how it helps us learn how to pray. But I want to give it to you again today. Uh, And before we kind of break it down and I teach you how I use it to pray, um, Let's just all read it and pray it together in its entirety. It's found in the book of Matthew. It's actually uh, where we were last week when we talked about fasting, if you remember. Matthew chapter 6, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, kind of Jesus' greatest single teaching, a lot of different themes in here. Uh, But before he talked about fasting, he talked about prayer. And Jesus, in teaching how to pray, here's how he said to pray. Let's all pray this together out loud. Ready? Begin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, as I said earlier, there is nothing wrong with reciting this prayer. I recite this prayer regularly and often. But this prayer, Jesus didn't just intend for us to repeat his words. He intended for us to use this as a model to lead us into deeper prayer. So how do I pray this prayer? I'm going to teach you using the five statements real quick. We're going to fly through these. So hang with me. Number one, pray with confidence and worship. We can start prayer being confident that God welcomes us, that he is approachable. That's why Jesus purposely chose the word father, right? I mean, Jesus could have chose any number of words there to describe God. He could have said, start your prayer by saying, oh, omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing, mighty, glorious God. He could have, and all those are true of who God is, but he purposely chose the word father. It's the idea of daddy, that we have this loving, approachable, heavenly father. And so that's how we are to begin prayer, with confidence. But let's look back. What did he say? Our Father who is where? In heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. And so that means worship. The very first thing that we do in prayer is we worship God. We thank him for who he is and all of the things that he has done. And so when I pray, this is how I always start. And I've learned how um, practically where to pray I felt really honestly unsuccessful with prayer in my uh, 20s and probably even early 30s where it was something I would do, but I just didn't, it didn't, I didn't feel like I was always in a great rhythm, rhythm with prayer. And then I figured out for me, and I've shared this many times, I pray best when I walk. I don't pray best when I sit or, or stay in a single space. I pray best when I walk. And, I, and virtually almost always when I pray, I pray through the Lord's Prayer. And so the first thing I do is I start and I say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I just begin to pray, God, thank you that I can call you Father. Thank you that you invite me 
into your presence. Thank you that you love me. You extend grace for me. And then I begin with worship. God, I thank you for who you are, that you are awesome. You are mighty. Holy is your name. You are worthy of all the honor and all the praise that I could give. And, and that lasts anywhere from a minute to 10 minutes. It just depends. And then sometimes I'll I'll sing like a worship song. I have headphones in and I'll play a worship song during that and uh, make sure nobody's too close that they can hear me while I'm, I'm walking. Um, other times uh, I'll, I'll read a psalm. I use our Bible in, in one year app most mornings. Um, and so reading a psalm of praise, there's many ways you can do it. But that's how we begin in prayer, with confidence that God invites us and with respect and worship for who he is. And then the second way that we pray, how we pray, is this. Number two, pray with peace and seek God's priorities. Pray with peace and seek God's priorities. The reason we can have peace in prayer is because God is working his purposes. He's always working. And so I can have peace and I can trust God when I put his kingdom over my own. My soul can find peace, even internal peace, even when there is outward chaos in my life, when I trust God's plans and purposes for me are good. This is why Jesus said the second statement that we are supposed to pray is what? God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Not my kingdom, not my will, but yours, God, on earth, in me, as it is in heaven. And so this prayer is about letting go of my agenda and finding God's. And so what I do is the next thing I pray. I, I, I recite the single statement, and then here's what I do. I begin to pray through all of the uh, roles and responsibilities of my life. And so as I'm walking, the first thing I do is I pray, God, would your kingdom come and your will be done in me? Lord, would you help me to align my life with your priorities? God, help me see where it is you are leading and guiding me right now. Help me understand the work that you want to do in me. Help me see it. And then I begin to pray through, God, would your kingdom come and your will be done in my family? And I name each of my family members by name. And I pray that God's purposes, that, that they would align their life with God's purposes, that his will for them would be clear. And then I pray for our church. God, would your kingdom come and your will be done in Eastlake Church and in our community church movement. God, would you help us to not be ahead of you or behind you, but would you help us keep in step with your spirit? Would you help us to see what your priorities and next steps are? Then I pray for our city. God, would your kingdom come and your will be done in Chula Vista as it is in heaven. And I pray for needs and situations that I'm aware of in our city, in our state. Dear Jesus, would your kingdom come and your will be done in California, in our nation, in our world. And I just pray through those different areas in our life. And here's the reality. I can have peace when I'm trying to align myself with God's priorities and go at his pace, not my priorities and my pace. Number three, how do we pray? Pray with faith for what you need. Pray with faith for what you need. I can pray with faith because now what do I know? I have a good, loving, heavenly Father who invites me in, who has good plans and purposes for my life. And so because I already know those things, and that he's all-powerful, and he is almighty, and he is good, now I can bring my needs. Give me, what does it say? The prayer. Give us today our daily bread. In other words, give me what I need today. So here's what that looks like for me. When I'm praying in this section, I just go through all of the things that have been occupying my mind that I know I need, people I love need, the church that I lead needs. And so this is the area, like I just have a list and so again, you could do this walking, you could do this writing. I know a lot of people that write out um, their prayers in these sections and journals. And so I just pray, God, give us today what I need. Lord, here's what's going on in me. Here's what's coming up. Here's the things that I believe you're leading. And so God, I'm asking you, would you help? Would you provide? Would you meet that need? I pray for you, people in our church that, that I know have, have needs and, and, and areas that they need God to break through in their life. 
I pray for family members. I just, I pray for all the needs that I'm aware of. And I do it with faith, knowing that God is already at work. And then next, how do we pray? Number four, real quick, pray with humility and confession. Pray with humility and confession. This is where we talk to God about whatever may be pulling us away from him and his best. We own our sin and we confess it. Like actually write it down or say it out loud. And and by the way, just in case you're wondering, God, you're not going to surprise God by whatever you confess, right? God's not going to be like, you did what? Like he already knows he's God. And so again, I know what some of you are thinking because I've thought this before. Well, if God already knows, why do I need to confess it? Like, 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 why do I actually need to confess it? Here's why. Because God wants us to see it for what it is. Sin. It's less than his best. And he wants us to see how it breaks our relationship with him and how sin always breaks relationships with others. And he wants us to see it and own it. Why? So that he can forgive it and remove it. This is why Jesus taught us to pray and forgive us our debts. We start with us. God, forgive me of my sin. This is what we're trying to do during this Lent season. Emptying ourselves. God, forgive us our debts. And then God, help us to be forgivers. And so in this section, here's what we're doing. We're releasing hurts and harms that others have done to us. The same way God releases the hurts and the harms that we've done to him. And then lastly, here's how we pray. Pray with openness for God's power. Pray with openness for God's power. As we empty ourselves of our sin and our priorities and those hurts, God promises to fill us up with his spirit, to give us power to help us do what we could never do on our own. And that's why Jesus ended the prayer with this. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God always promises us a way out of temptation and victory over the enemy of our soul. And it doesn't come through our strength and power. It comes when we're tapped into his strength and power. We're always going to have the enemy of our soul, our flesh, and the world trying to pull us away from God's best. And so we pray, God, would your spirit be strong in me? Would you fill me up so I can resist those things, the enemy of our soul, my own flesh that wants to live my way on my terms, and the world and a culture that so often rejects you and lives in opposition of you. God, would you help me stay strong through your spirit in me? This is how we pray. So here's my question. Will you take some time this week to pray? I'm giving you what I'm calling the Lord's Prayer Challenge this week. However you pray, maybe take a break. And here's what I want to ask you. At least three, maybe get crazy, five days this week. Find, you could do this in five minutes. You could do it in 15. You could do it in 50. But find a few minutes where you can pray through this pattern. Take the outline, use the app, write it down. And begin to say, okay, I'm going to do this. And if you will do it, here's what I believe will happen for you because it happens for me every time I do it. Jesus often withdrew to lonely, quiet places and prayed. Why? So that he could be refueled. He could realign his priorities with God's. That's what happens when we pray. And so this week, let's be people who pray three to five times. Let's, let's do this and say, God, I'm going to give you a little more space and a little more time. That's what this Lent season is all about, where it's all about making room, making more room for God in our lives. In fact, we're going to end by receiving communion and then one last song, which is a great prayer about making room. And before that song, I'm going to invite us to receive communion together. We've been doing that each week of this series as part of these mini Easter celebrations during Lent, leading us up to Easter celebrating the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. We practice open communion. So I want to invite you, if you'd like to participate, you are welcome to. You don't have to be a member or gone to a special class. Everybody's welcome at the Lord's table. If you're a believer in Jesus, what we're doing is we are remembering and celebrating what Christ has done for us and what he promises to do. Go ahead and grab some crackers, some juice, get ready there. 
And here's what I want to do. I want to give us a moment of silent prayer before we receive these elements together. And in this moment, let's start with confidence and worship. God, thank you that you invite us into your presence. God, thank you that we are more loved by you than we could ever know, so much so that Jesus gave his life, his body broken, his blood poured out so that we could be forgiven and restored to you. God, we worship you and say thank you. Let's take a moment and say thank you and worship God on our own, and then I'll lead us in receiving these elements together. Go ahead and take the bread. Hold it in your hand. God loves you. His body was beaten and broken for you. Let's eat the bread and worship Jesus together. Then if you'll open the cup. The cup represents the blood of Christ poured out, covering our sin, your sin, my sin, once and for all. Let's drink the cup and worship Jesus together. As I said, we're going to share one more song. I love this song. It's, it's from a friend's church uh, up in the Chicago area. Um, and the song is titled Make Room. And it speaks to what we're trying to do during Lent that we're trying to give Jesus more room in our lives to do his good work, to make him, as our scripture verse said at the beginning of this, more and more at room in our hearts. And so let's make this our prayer and then let's do it this week by praying. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for your invitation to simply come into your presence and receive your goodness and your kindness and grace. And God, may we be reminded of that today. May we be reminded there's no condemnation in Christ, that we don't need to feel bad about ourselves because maybe of our struggles in prayer. But God, you welcome us as a good, loving, heavenly Father. And so this week, may we make more room for you to do your good work in us. We sing this and pray this out together. In Jesus' name, amen.